The Super Nintendo was my favorite console, featuring a library of games that absolutely stood the test of time. Using one today is pretty easy, as it outputs a wide variety of signals, making it usable on almost any CRT or scaler. All the larger SNES and Super Famicoms can output RF, composite, S-video, and RGB simply by plugging in a cable. And there's even one decent HDMI cable option as well. While I'd consider the Super Nintendo's output mostly high quality, some revisions are much better for RGB or component video output than others. So I figured I'd put together a basic video going over the output quality, as well as showcase some mods that makes every Super Nintendo's RGB output look amazing. Let's check them out. Let's start with a brief history of SNES revisions. The launch release of the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom shared the exact same motherboard revision, the SHVC. Other than the rear power jack and RF modulator, they were identical and outputted equal quality video. These original models also had a second board for audio. And a quick note, if this isn't plugged in, your SNES won't boot. I've made that mistake quite a few times before. Over the years, Nintendo created many board revisions, and while each were slightly different, they all used the same two video chips to output the signal. As a result, most people refer to all revisions with this configuration as the two-chip motherboards. Then, towards the end of the SNES's lifespan, Nintendo consolidated the video chips into one single chip and named this revision the one chip. There's three types of one chips, with all outputting much sharper RGB video than all previous revisions, with some drawbacks that I'll go over later. The final one chip 03 revision outputs the same exact quality as the Dash 1 and Dash 2, but requires a mod to work with most RGB SCART cables. I normally just suggest installing a bypass to enable that, which I'll also show later. For a long time, people were always on the lookout for these because they retained the original look of the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom, but contained the upgraded motherboard. You can usually guess if it's a one chip by the serial number or bottom markings, assuming no one changed the case over the years, but the only way to tell for sure is opening it up, especially to confirm which one chip revision you may have. One easy way to guarantee the sharper output was by purchasing an SNES Mini, as all came with the same one chip motherboard, However, none outputted RGB by default. Enabling RGB and even S-Video was fairly easy, but it was frustrating for people who just wanted to find a nice looking SNES and start RGB gaming. So now that you have a basic idea of what to expect from SNES revisions, let's check out examples as well as show off some of those mods I talked about. SNES output quality is often misunderstood, so I would just like to start with a basic example. Here's an original launch edition SHVC motherboard on the left, and a later one-chip SNES on the right, both outputting RF to a consumer-grade CRT. Other than the one-chip being a bit too bright, more on that in a bit, they basically look the same, right? Now, here's screenshots using the RetroTINK 4K, comparing the two-chip and one-chip boards outputting composite video. They also look basically the same, right? And while yes, you could definitely start to see a difference when switching to S-Video via a high-end scaler like the Tink 4K or 5X, it's really hard to tell a difference on a consumer CRT, and I guess even lower resolution S-Video scalers. This is just my opinion, but if I owned a two-chip SNES and I liked to game on a CRT that had either S-Video or composite video inputs, I would enjoy it exactly as is and never even worry about anything else. In fact, if you take a look at the color output on an oscilloscope, specifically the measurement of BY minus AY shown here, you can see the video voltage is exactly where it should be, which is why the colors and brightness look correct, even though it might not be as sharp. But let's check out the RGB quality of a Launch Edition 2 chip. Now you see why people often talk about the poor video quality from a 2 chip. What they're actually talking about is how using RGB exposes how blurry the output of the two chips actually is, something you wouldn't notice on the softer composite video output most of us were using back in the day. If your setup is already full RGB, especially if you're using a high-end CRT or scaler, this is a big step down in quality. While some two chips are better than others, they all have some issues. Here's the notorious APU revision that always has diagonal interference all over the screen. 
I'm not going to show examples of all the issues with each revision, but luckily there's a fix for every one. We'll go over that one at the end. Let's move on to the one chips now, as they're great options. As you can see, the video output is really sharp, but too bright. You can see using test patterns that the colors towards the right start to look the same much too soon. While each console will output slightly different voltage, this reading of 750 millivolts is common and definitely too bright. See, the proper video voltage on each color channel should be 714 millivolts, but it's not realistic to expect every analog video console to hit exactly that, so there's always going to be some kind of tolerance. Here's where it gets interesting though. Anything below 714, and I would say even down as low as about 600 millivolts, is totally fine, just a bit dimmer. However, as soon as you start to go over 714, the colors start to wash out and you're losing detail. So basically, too dim within reason, just turn up the brightness and it'll look exactly as it should, but too bright and you're already starting to lose information that could never be recovered and harming the image. Fixing this on the one chips is easy though, as you'd simply need to add three resistors as shown here, and the brightness should be brought back down to a normal level on all outputs. If you're on a budget, that's perfect. However, if you're looking for a slight performance boost as well as a brightness correction, you could perform an RGB bypass and install a modern RGB amp instead of adding the resistor. Something similar is actually required on the SNES Mini or Super Famicom Junior, and the performance is the exact same as the longer one chips, so now let's switch to talking about amp installation in the context of the Mini just to save time. For some inexplicable reason, Nintendo included all the chips necessary to output S-Video and RGB from the Mini and Junior consoles, but didn't run the signal lines to the video chip. Seriously, how weird is that? Running the traces from the chip to the amp would have been free, and it would have just cost a few pennies to add the resistors and capacitors required, so I'm not really sure what they were doing there. Anyway, there's a few ways to restore this capability to the SNES Mini. First, if you're on a budget, you could just hand wire some components and use the chip that's already on the board. That'll work totally fine, and you'll have a great looking RGB and S-Video output. You could even purchase an expansion board that makes this a bit easier if you're interested, but it's my opinion that if you're going to spend some time refurbishing and upgrading your Mini, you might want to consider getting a bypass amp. It works the same way as the onboard amp, however you're using more modern components with lower tolerances, which results in a tiny bit better RGB output. What you'll end up with is an excellent video output from a mod that's not too complicated, and the RGB output will be the same on all one chips, both the minis and the larger ones. For a long time, this was really your only option if you wanted high quality RGB output from an SNES, find a one chip or mini and mod it. That's not the case anymore though. Voltar just released a mod for two chips that makes all revisions look like this. For the first time, we have a way to make the RGB output of older two chip Super Nintendo and Super Famicoms equal sharpness as the one chips, but with the proper color and brightness as well. In fact, the screenshot I'm showing now is the same SHVC revision I started with. It does come with a downside though. Most two-chip motherboard revisions will require you to disable composite and S-Video for the bypass to work. Not a problem for people who exclusively use RGB SCART setups, but it might be a downer for people who game on CRTs via composite and use RGB SCART through a scaler or higher-end monitor. So once again, if you're using RF, composite, or S-Video, I wouldn't worry about this at all, but if you're looking to get the highest quality RGB output from your original SNES consoles, now you no longer have to hunt down a one chip, and you might even just be able to use that original childhood console you probably have that most likely would be a two chip. That said, I think if you've already invested in something like a PVM or BVM RGB monitor, or if you own higher end scalers like the OSSCs or the Tink 5X or 4K, you'll absolutely want to consider the upgrade. Especially if it's an older 2 chip, as the quality of this new bypass is as good as it gets with analog video. So what if you're looking to play your Super Nintendo games at the highest quality and accuracy possible with no added latency, but you don't want to mod your console or maybe you've already done a full refurbish but you don't want to mod it any further? Well, there are some good alternatives. First, there's some really high quality hardware emulation solutions like the Mr. FPGA project and the Super NT from Analog. The Super NT even allows you to use your original cartridges, but they're never in stock so I wouldn't count on finding one. 
The Mr. Project runs on ROMs only, but the output is incredible. Plus, if you have one of the awesome Retro Castle cases, you could get high quality composite, S-video, RGB, component video, and HDMI output from it. While this won't replicate the look and feel of an original console, the gameplay is identical with zero lag added. I actually know a lot of people who refurbish all of their original consoles, but keep them completely stock and leave them hooked up to a CRT, but they use a mister for gaming on either a BVM or an OLED flat panel through a high-end scaler. Maybe that's an option for you. I'd just definitely not recommend buying any of those cheap HDMI clone consoles out there. They all have a ton of lag and often process the image completely wrong. You'd be much better off just getting an original SNES and either a cheap or free CRT or just the cheapest scaler out there than using one of those. If you're using a two-chip SNES and want RGB output, there are some alternatives, and I'll start with the one that's completely free. If you have an original OSSC or RetroTINK 5X, you could run a reverse low-pass filter to sharpen it up a bit. As you can see, it helps a bit, but this is no substitute for a bypass. That said, if you already own one of these scalers, why not give it a try? The worst thing that could happen is you decide you don't like it and change the setting back. I certainly think it's worth a moment of your time to try. As for any of the other 2-chip RGB mods, I'm not sure if there's any one that I would recommend, at least not now. One definitely worth mentioning is a kind of complicated mod from developer Opetus that requires you to remove one of the two video chips. However, it's still a tiny bit glitchy with some motherboard revisions, as you can see here on the top and bottom. Respectfully, I wouldn't use it over Voltar's mod, as it also disables all outputs other than RGB, and it's much harder to install. That said, if it was ever made into an HDMI mod, I think it would be an awesome option for two-chip owners, regardless of how complicated the mod might be. And for the record, people have been working for years on other two-chip RGB bypasses, but none were consistent and all had issues. Many sharpened up the image, which ended up just highlighting some of the other issues with two-chip consoles, essentially making it look worse, even though it was sharper. Others would only work on some motherboard revisions, and some only worked with some certain games. Now, by no means am I trying to throw shade on any of the developers who worked on those projects, because if it wasn't for all of their research and testing, we would have never gotten to where we are today with the current bypass. So absolute props to them, I just wouldn't suggest anybody installing it unless you're an expert that's just looking to experiment. Well, that's it. A basic overview of Super Nintendo video quality output and the RGB upgrades available, if that's something that matters to you. And what do you think? Are you going to be keeping your SNES completely stock? Are you going to be modding it? Are you going to be having a mix of hardware emulation as well as original consoles? Or are you just going to use software emulators to play the game, including Switch's online service that has a bunch of Super Nintendo games? Honestly, there's no wrong answer. It's just whatever's best for you. If you liked this video and want to see more like it, please consider supporting the channel. RetroRGB.com just turned off all Google ads to try and make a better user experience, but that's only possible due to the amazing Patreon and Floatplane supporters. So please consider signing up. If you're not in a position to, you can still help by using general affiliate links to buy the same stuff on Amazon for the same price you were going to pay anyway, but we get a cut. And don't forget about the affiliate links in the description too, because those really help. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.